with our meditation practices there to be able to um, generate the kind of support, internal support, firmness and clarity and uh, calm, kindness yeah, to be able to experience things as they are or things as they become dhammas, phenomena in their true light which is free from self they're not selves now generally we experience things very much from the position the central theme and focus and you know immovable object in our lives is I am this is happening to me whatever else is happening the main ongoing uh, unity fixed point is it's happening to me and whatever is done I do it you know so there's the we say the receptive or the passive it happens to me and then that's what and then there's the activity the agent I'll do this I want to do this, or I can't do this, or the doing bit, or I should do this, or I don't know what to do. That trembling of intention, skillful or unskillful, the inclination to to do. However, you know, you want to figure that, that it's physical or thought, try and figure this out, or even emotional, or be a bit kinder, more spacious about experience and the underlying um, reality is the I am <clears throat> and uh, happening to me and so just the other day it's kind of saying you can just see these two entities themselves as rather separate yeah one the, the me sense the things that come into the sphere of attention that which is held through attention uh, you know, perceptions, sensations, feelings. They only happen to me if I'm if I if there's attention there, isn't it? Some kind of attention. You know, so things that I don't notice don't happen to me. <laughs> you know, so any just sitting in meditation. You know, there's all kinds of experiences your body might have been through. But right now they're they're not configuring me because they're not happening. You're not remembering skiing or swimming or dancing or being in such and such a place. So those things, objects, aren't creating the me sense. It's happening to me. What is happening to me is perhaps breathing in and out, physical sensations in my body, um, memories, happy or unhappy, that are happening now, and the, all that. The bag that they occur in is the me, isn't it? Attention. Mm. Yeah. But we realise this me seems to not very consistent because mm. it's consistently there, and yet when you try to get to it, what is it? Memories, impressions of me, change. Yeah. Feeling a failure, feeling a winner, feeling necessary, feeling important, feeling unneeded, feeling welcome, feeling, you know, that's who I, that's the me. So it's continually changing its characteristics and it's essentially something that's generated on the back of phenomena that arise. So the me isn't really... You know, the primary reality, the real, is a secondary impression that's created after perceptions, feelings, sensations arise. Hmm? So the hearing creates the me who hears it. Hmm? The sound creates the me who hears it. The pain creates the me who suffers with it. Hmm? Yeah, you know. As the me is an inference that comes after the event. Mm. 
the event we call, you know, attention, perception. So it's generally, there's never one thing arising, it's generally, you know, several dhammas arise, attention, perception, feeling, contact, these kinds of, you know, this is what sparks, creates the reality of the present moment as phenomenon. Is this coming together of these dhammas. And all of them, when you focus any one of them, this they can be seen as transient, unreliable, and generally, and um, not something that you can really own. And yet this me sense gets built on top of that endless cascade. That is a feeling of being then in a universe we're sort of bombarded by things that happen to me and who am I in that and what I want what I don't want essentially this irresolute unsatisfied discomfort arises with that sense wherever whatever so it's going to be happening to me <laughs> It won't always be what I want. pleasant or sustainable. And then we consider also that we're bound to aging and death. Now, those experiences. So it's the, the me sense carries with it this inherent dissatisfaction discontent, discomfort, irresolute, not satisfied, not stable, not steady, and yet nagging away. You know, something happens. And what generally happens with that, as things become me, then as the I am comes in to compensate, to respond, to deflect, to improve, to change, to do something about what happened to me. <laughs> it's called intention. You know, this kind of jumps up. Somebody criticizes you, up comes the defense. You know, it's cold, you know, you huddle. So it's pleasant, it comes up, you want to stay with it. But, you know, these two, all the intentions that we have, are always aimed at the possibility of the future. You know, so sometimes these are very obvious, like what am I going to do next year? Should I take, you know, should I become a monk or a nun? What am I going to do about my da da da, you know, the future? You can't have an intention without some kind of future. As long as, the, as long as the I am's in it, it's always going to have some kind of future. Either it's the future of the next moment. If I just move my knee, I'll be happy. I'll be comfortable. Just imagine that, uh, you know. <laughs> so and to a certain extent, these things do occur to a certain degree. Otherwise, we would never do them. And yet, and yet, you never know the future. But the I am and the intentionality is always inclining towards something that isn't here. Whether it's good or bad, pleasant or unpleasant, skillful or unskillful, it's not here. The I am always has to rest upon something that isn't here. The I. Yeah. So both these positions are pretty fragile, aren't they, for the so-called centre of our reality? <laughs> what is facing something that isn't here? The other one's based on something that's continually changing and uncertain. No wonder it's so bound up with this restless quality and uncertainty and hovering. Mm. And in that, we don't really even see dhammas as dhammas, phenomena as phenomena. It's not really, 
you know, aware of sensation. It's, oh, this is happening to me. I got this feeling. Uh, it's not just the, I'm using words, but it's not just the verbal, it's the impression. You know, when something happens, it happens to me. It's not just, there's a sound. So we don't really, you know, to actually apprehend dhammas as dhammas takes, you know, some skill, some training, some meditation, some dispassion. So there isn't that kind of uh, inference, isn't necess- doesn't have to be made. It's the root inference called grasping, taking on, inc- leaning on, assumptions, feeding on, something that kind of, and it feeds, you know, that is what generates the me and the I am. So, upadana, grasping, clinging, these are very strong terms of something that doesn't appear like that, but the inclining towards the concocting and the I am, the me, the I, the myself that comes out at the end of that. So if you can kind of bear that in mind, you begin to contemplate this sense of self. As a, you know, self, I am, as an experience in the present moment, is the result, is bound up with this upadana, clinging, grasping, and if the upadana could cease or stop happening, there would be a release from this restless, unsatisfiable shifting of the mind, the sangsara. So it's just a little activity of inference, of taking hold that needs to just be released. You could say, you know, all of our Dhamma practice is just to do this. Sounds, oh, that's my, this should, shouldn't be too difficult, should it? <laughs> just this one thing. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's quite a big thing, quite an ingrained thing. So when we train in meditation, we're setting up a kind of a relationship with prescribed phenomena, breathing in and out, sensations in the body, whatever, your object, and then experiencing that and, you know, because it's the same sort of thing time and time again, and beginning to let all the, the trying to get it right, and the I am this, I'm in this state, or I've learned, or I'm this level of a realization, or let all that stuff kind of be heard and steam off. Sometimes I think it's just almost the process of just letting stuff bubble away until it's steamed itself off, and you, something the mind has got given up on it, on all the things I can say about me. There's quite a lot of things I can say about me. <laughs> but <laughs> when you heard them often enough, long enough, I think this is just uh, you know, agitation or aversion or sadness or pride or, you know, just being able to name the creative potency of any the Dhammas. So you're coming through that into the Dhammas or the really they are keeping this I am sense alive. And then just to be able to see a Dhamma as a Dhamma is a tremendous possibility. It's like you begin to take some of the particularly the repetitive stories, you know, the repetitive character that arises. You've probably got a few characters that arise in your mind you know you know it's saddened ones and important ones and hurt ones and courageous ones and aspira you know those are good ones and the dented ones and the sort of bruised ones and you know those things actually if you could say the and they have stories, and you just get that down to like one word that would sum it up as an activity. 
he might find something like regret or anxiety or need or yeah, you know it's not unusual is it for human beings to experience these experiences there's a sense of the regret or the need or the you know, whatever it is and then how do we relate to that so then the intentionality is just coming towards something that's a bit more present and instead of how do I become somebody else how do I become, you know somebody who doesn't have regret or somebody who's happy or somebody who's confident and clear how in fact do I learn to using this language here meet that which arises just meet it so you, instead of future you know, what can I become how can I be something other than this how will it be like when this is away what am I supposed to do to solve this problem with my family my place my possessions my illness my mental states my da da career with a, with a, so I can get it clear no, how do you meet the confusion meet the agitation meet the impatience restlessness so you try and get it down to the, like the, just the one word even if it's not exactly right you kind of, is that it? and, you, and then you're beginning to then feel, if you like, feel the Dhamma is a Dhamma rather than just name it. Hmm. With whatever that carries. So our intentionality then to me to shift it from you know what I will be, what I should do, but Maybe just kind of shifting it to how is this experience met? What really is the Dhamma here in this kind of very potential, potent cascade that can create a world of past, present, future, other people, life, meaning of life, Theravada Buddhism, you know, with all its potencies and they can just spark off more and more and more till in fact you know the mind is just fireworks and you can get down the other way to actually where's the triggering point around this yeah and that, that triggering point might change in the first point it might just be overwhelmed too much just can't manage and that kind of oh feeling or yeah. So, kind of like there's a kind of lot, a lot going on, which you experience. You know, you could feel as kind of negativity, uncertainty, fear, intimidation, wanting. So the whole thing is, what is it? First of all, the first word is just too dang much. You know, overwhelmed. Okay, then that's the first. All right, how do you meet that? What's the meeting of that? Well, first you name it. You're know, overwhelmed, and then how's that feel? Bodily, it's kind of hyper state, like your skin's coming off, his nerve endings dangling out, head feels heavy, whatever it is. It's, can you come into that bodily reference and meet the body, meet it as a bodily experience? Somehow or another, that always will tend to produce a more rounded out response you know much more caring response than just stop being this way you know get it together <laughs> impatience you know, it's kind of we tend to find with our you know we tend to snap at our snap and snarl at our mental stuff or whimper at it you know, you know feeling in the body 
perhaps there's a little more sense of relationship can occur around the bodily experience. How's it feeling in your face, your shoulders, wherever it is? And then can we, without really adding more to the topic, just go to the, if you like, the charge of it, the energetic charge, and see if you can find the whole body rather than just the rushing, flooding experience in your face. Can you come from that down to your feet, uh, to the hands, to the back, to the spine? So you're not doing anything about it, really, but just widening the base. So instead of, you know, the me experiencing it, the body's experiencing it. And in a way, that kind of just takes away that that peace that is so ingrained and actually is the block to release, is the me sense. Now in the mind, you know, you can have that. I've always been this way. It's happened for the last five years I've been doing this. There's been kind of stuff coming up. And it's always like this because, you know, my parents were like this. And I was born in this state and I was married here and I got divorced there. And, uh, and I never had this and too much of that. Boom, boom, there it is, you know. Huge realm of history which, you know, you could say has some truth in it. It's not the complete truth. It doesn't have, I got on a bus on Thursday the 9th of April. That's not part of that story. That gets filtered out. I think I scratched my nose on March the 22nd. That's nothing important. I had a decent cup of tea in February. That's not part of it. Part of it is, you know, these particular triggering points that you've got in your bag for that one. You know, and then... So you don't really want to go in too much into that mental state because it will just, um, you know, bring up a, a huge um, conglomeration of, of more potent stuff. It will trigger everything off. And you might have these very, you know, difficult places that suddenly it always comes back to that one something I didn't do, or I never had, or happened to me, that particular thing, you know, it was... <laughs> so that isn't really uh, going to take you to Dhammas, take you to, um, you know, understanding historical self, the development of that, which has its uses. Perhaps in being able to more accurately profile the particular potencies that get you. So you become more clear about that. Here's the victim or the burden carrier or the one who never got or the one who had too much or whatever. You know, you're going to feel that one in your body. Meet it. So you just, and that sense of widening it to include your whole body tends to lessen the charge. It's like the, the voltage. It's like you, it's not so compressed anymore, so it becomes less uh, fiery. Or, you know, it's like your body becomes like a water, it can absorb this. Meet it. Widening. Just to be able to, you know, see experience as a Dhamma rather than as a person. You 
So can we get one of these kind of chains of of thought and emotion come running through with their, you know, what I need, what other people are like, why this isn't act enough, why this isn't good enough, what I could have. It's essentially like turn, as I say, turn to the face of the mind. What do you think that mind state if you had to have a face, what do you think it would look like? Would it have its eyes bulging? <laughs> would it be grinding its jaws? Would it be a kind of, you know, twisted up? Would it be shining, bright, open? Uh, which one do you want to have? Which one do you want to live with? You have a choice, actually. And to remember that, you know, the Buddha only pointed these things out with the understanding there is a remedy. You don't have to be. The mind doesn't have to be contained by this grasping. So you don't, so you're just kind of bearing in mind, and that's even remembering and touching into, even generating or in, aspiring to what it's like. What's the face of the mind? when it's open, when it's trusting, when it's at ease with itself, when it's loved, when we feel happy in that way, we feel welcome, we feel okay. What would that be like? What would it be like? (laughs) You know, if you don't experience it, what would it be like? Just try to bring some of those little points in and what would it be like just to feel there's no pressure, free moment, Everything's taken away, your burdens are dropped, you're welcome right here, what would that be like? Mm. You know, so it's shining. Mm. So you, you know, and you begin to, perhaps, the reference to the, the clarity of the mind, when the mind is at home, You can see more clearly these stains, these features that run across it, that pucker us up and make us kind of twist and furrow and knot and tremble, demand. What's the face of the mind? And when you see that face, you see the kind of furrowed and the nervy or the pushy or the domineering or whatever it is, just, just meet that and who's that, you know. So it's essentially the quality of intentionality is just really to to meet, not to change in any way, not to assess or judge, but just to try to meet it more clearly and make the meeting, aha, uh-huh, being a stranger to oneself. Who is this person who just walked in? Mm. Looks like this. So for that moment we are actually, you know, the intention is a source of karma, action. Action always has a result. Vipaka. Vipaka, the results are the major element of what is experienced as me. So old, call it, someone's called, Parker, someone's called old karma, the result. For example, you know, when he's born with sense organs, that's the result of being born. Because you have eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, you're bound to have, you know, things happening to it. It's their functioning. Mm-hmm. It's bound to be sights, sounds, feelings, impressions, and so on. Yeah. This is what you call the old karma. And then there are particular activities we may have undertaken that leave their results we park you know, things I did or didn't or even in my mind, you know, the holding on to a grudge or uh or skillfully, you know, things I did that was uh, generous and 
patient and caring. It's good and bad. That's that's kind. That's the things that we experience as the, the me sense takes these as its signature tune. Unfortunately, a lot of the time, it's the negative ones that seem to strike up the band, rather than the probably many acts of simple courtesy, friendliness, obliging, volunteering, willing, being okay, that you've undertaken. Because they didn't need any resolving. <laughs> the ones that stuck are the ones that, oh, you know, haven't actually been allowed to pass through. That's why they have to be met, to allow them to pass through. You know, so with this, we're not really getting rid of them, but letting them, opening a door where they could pass through in their own time. So the intention then is, the new karma is to get to the end of karma. So the ending of karma means there's no intention to become something else in the future. No intention to get better, wiser, more enlightened. You know, just the intention is to just stop that. Meet what arises. Yeah. Let the door open for these things to pass through. So it's like you're emptying the bag or letting the bag empty. And it, it will. This is what mindfulness and uh, some full awareness, alertness is about. Mindfulness bearing something in mind, alertness, is alertness what the what the dumber is that's arising, the feeling of it, the movement of it, the changeability of it, the not selfness of it, clearly comprehending it. It's just this. We notice the changing of it, the rising up, the subsiding and maybe it seems to come back again, rises up, subsides, noticing the endings, the moments when things subside, or the moments when things arise, staying longer in that, just to get a fuller, wider picture of the whole thing. Because the, often the roots of these um, formations are the bits we haven't, are not there in awareness. The fidgeting, the restless, the searching, the the me mining, looking for something to get going on, you know? Who can bear silence? Even not speaking is difficult enough. Yeah. Who can actually bear silence of the mind without something wanting to get going on it? Hmm? So this is in a way isn't something you can suddenly command yourself to do, but you begin to wean yourself of the fascination with these dhammas, the lamenting over them, the fondling of them, the potencies of them, where they create these huge nebulous formations that cascade with all their feeling and so forth. You become nibida. Nibida means had enough. Uh, no longer in trance, no longer fascinated by feeling, sensation, self formations. Just, yeah, okay. And that really helps one, the mind kind of shift some of its preferences towards, yeah, okay, but there's this bit where it just empties out. It's quiet. This is what we can do in that uh, in the meditation. Learning to meet what arises. 
wing it. Is there a system for winging it? <laughs> I think all my ever since so. Uh, after childhood, childhood was relatively what it was, but then as you kind of, kind of coming to, into more into a personality and recognizing the world, like you know, nine, ten, and so forth, what are you going to do? What are you going to do in your life? In school, first of all, it's all mess set up. You go to school, okay go to this then, okay, you're good at history or geography or whatever, you go to this class, okay, and you get there, you go to university, that's a good idea, you're supposed to do that, you go to that, and then, well, now what are you going to do? <laughs> I can never figure out what to do. <laughs> you know, because it always seems to come down to, you know, somehow taking on a something and then just being bound into that something with its limitations. You can only be a, you know, you've got a job, you're going to be in this town teaching these people this, that and the other, you know, this particular thing. Yeah, but, yeah, but, you know, but so what? But so what? So I can never figure out what to do. Still don't know what to do, but it hasn't been a problem. I seem to have been quite busy. Now, 63, can't say there's been nothing to do, but I never knew what to do. <laughs> but over time, you, know, you just get better at, well, I don't know, open this door, open this box, this seems about right, that feels better than that, and you just kind of do that, you know. But then uh, the idea, so if somebody says to me, you know, as kind of 15, I think you should be a monk, you think you must be crazy. I don't want to be a monk. What do you be a monk for? A monk kind of stuck in some boring monastery or, you know, muttering prayers to himself, totally out of touch with the world, you know, boring, no friends, no fun, eating his bowl of porridge and every day. I don't want to do that. That's what I've ended up doing. <laughs> except, except it wasn't quite like that. That's what it looks like on the label, you know. And you know, actually, no, it's kind of churning through, you know, love and hate and passion and joy and greed and excitement and aspiration and, you know, calm and quiet and all these tremendous worlds opened up just through meeting what arises, you know, you really get to the point of what activity is about, you know. And so much of people assume you doing something is really related to earning a living, getting a job, you know, what people can see from the outside. But actually most of it is about what's happening in the mental realm, psychological feeling senses. So that's really where the karma is, isn't it? Then you start to think, if I hadn't, you know, I could do this. If I hadn't been a monk, I could have been a da 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 You get the regret. Or, or somebody, you know, if I had been a monk, somebody said to me the other day, oh, you know, like he's 60. If only I'd be, you know, been, been a monk for a while, he'd disrobed. If only I'd stayed as a monk, I'd been, you know, I'd been much happier. Yep. And I can say, if only I hadn't become a monk, I, if only I hadn't become a monk, I'd be much happier. <laughs> it's just called regret. <laughs> and you get to it about somewhere in your fifties and sixties, you start to re get the sense of if only. When you're twenty, you can't really have much of an if only because you haven't got much 
track record to work on. 50 or 60, you think, if only I had. When you're 20, you think, what should I? What should I be? 50 or 60, you're getting to the end of what should I be, but you're starting to recognise what was I. <laughs> and then if only I had, or I hadn't. So you're 20, you think, what could I? What should I? What will I? And you're 60, you think, what was I? How could it have been? It could have been different than this. Yeah? That's what it, that's what it does, is it? To take you away from the Dhamma creates these totally, you know, you can never fill in the gaps of what you should be or what how you could have been. They're totally impossible. They've got no details there, are there? I mean, I could have been a pirate or a space captain or a, I don't know, theoretically. I could be a rock and roll star. <laughs> Or I could have been dead. <laughs> I know. Yeah. So you just start to sort of contemplate some of these I am forms and me forms. And here's the doubt, the regret. The hunger, the imaginations. Meet that, meet what arises. Realize that the most important thing for the mind to find is not who I am, what I should do, what I was, but just the mind to find itself. It's clarity, it's openness, it's freedom. And so, you know, when you deepen into that, then you'll be able to get a little more um, confidence in how you take that to daily life, you might say. Just watch out for the signs. Of the kind of glow of promise or the fear. Oh, I don't know if I, I, don't know if I can manage that. No, no, that's not it what's bright, what sustains, what supports your mind now. It's your mind. This is what you're going to live with. It's your karma. You came in to this birth. It's your karma. You didn't owe it to anybody. You're not carrying anybody with you. Nobody's going to go with you when you die. So, what's what support? What's important now? Can you live your truth? However unformed it may seem, at least a bit more truer. And then, because in this cultivation, it's mysterious as to, you know, how our lives look from the outside. I mean, I mean, some people who seem to have it all wonderful careers, and actually they're completely empty inside. I feel just kind of nobody's and yet they're radiant. So you can't really determine what form, external form, you're going to take, but you start moving in line with your clarity, where you can see dhammas as dhammas, where you can meet them. You really find you're not able to meet, you know, what arises in this particular framework of meditation then you owe it to yourself to you know try something else work on another level do some dialoguing get somebody else to help you out change the venue even you know would always recommend it in fact that 
there's a sense in which you spend time somewhere, you move somewhere else, if you're really finding yourself that what's happening is more and more stuff's getting piled onto the plate rather than it's beginning to get cleared. Maybe this isn't the scenario, you know, shift it. But give it time, because it's often the case that as you start, you know, as you start to realize what's going on, a whole load of unprocessed dhammas start bustling in, you know. So give it some time. So we do a long retreat together. A lot of time for things to be experienced, felt. Are you heaping up more? Is more stuff getting laid on the plate, or is it beginning to thin, clear? Are some of the brightnesses coming in? Is there some, you know, strengths and clarities arising? This is what we start to look for if we're looking for guidelines on a, you know, a kind of temporal frame. But the edge of it is always going to be on the timeless, the immediate. Meet what arises, widen. Meet it fully, know it for what it is. Let it do what it does, let it move through. And our mindfulness is to, and our sense of restraint is just to stop the meddling and the tinkering and the regretting of it.